Hey, I am a bit of a stickler for getting started on time. So I think we'll go ahead and kick things off. Um, for those of you that are from the Poplar Grove neighborhood that I haven't met yet, uh, my name is Turner Bitten. I'm the chair of the Glendale Community Council. And Eric, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Eric Lopez and I'm the chair of the Poplar Grove Community Council. Uh, we are excited to do this joint meeting tonight electronically um, and very excited to welcome the different guests that we have tonight. Uh, to get started, we're going to have a legislative review. We have representatives Angela Romero and Sandra Hollins and Senator Luz Escamilla joining us. Um, and just a couple of housekeeping items. I have muted everyone. Uh, you will have to unmute yourself to ask questions. I just do this to minimize background noise. Uh, and then the second thing is this meeting is being recorded. We will post it on Facebook after the fact so that folks have access to what we talked about tonight. But with that, I will turn the time over to uh, representatives and Senator Escamilla. Hi, everyone. Um, it's always a pleasure to see you guys. And I, if it's okay with Representative Romero and Representative Hollins, we've done a couple of these community council virtual meetings. So I, I'm going to start maybe just giving you guys a little bit of a um, summary. And I apologize, I have my toddlers in the background. So I'm trying <laughs> to keep them quiet, which is a challenge. But I um, just a little bit of a, a summary of where we are in terms of, you know, po well, since session and um, now as we, you know, in the middle of a pandemic and COVID-19 and then what is what we're heading towards in terms of budget and changes happening. So as you know, we finished our legislative session on Friday the 13th, March the 13th, and um, we approve a, you know, a, a budget, finished our legislative work, and we went into uh, what our statute says of 30 days where the legislature can't do anything. And at that moment, the governor ex it starts his, you know, becomes now an emergency because of the pandemic ex to exercise his executive power in under an emergency situation. And, you know, while we're waiting for COVID-19 resources and funding from the federal government, but I just want you to know that during that time, the legislature, even though we could not act from a legislative perspective, there were multiple meetings as we were trying to look into how to respond to the situation we were facing. Some of us were also fighting the COVID-19 at home, uh, which is brutal. No, I don't recommend that for anyone. And um, through that process, a couple of things were very clear. One, uh, the need to act fast, but at the same time, some layers of transparency, um, also issues related to the relationship between the executive branch and the legislative branch under that emergency situation. Three, what's gonna happen to our communities? And we were predicting, your legislators that are here, that the communities on the west side were gonna be disproportionately be impacted more than any other community. And of course, now data clearly states that. And also, so for us, we uh, immediately after that, we started putting a plan in place to execute more targeted approaches to those communities that will be disproportionately impacted based on income, occupation, race, ethnicity, uh, you know, those, those infamous zip codes <clears throat> that were going to be impacted more than others. And we, through that process, we started heading towards the special sessions. We've had already four special sessions since the end of the legislative session. And through those le special legislative sessions, the first thing we did is a take the federal funds that came through the Relief Act, the uh, CARES Act. Those funds are uh, obviously the number one priorities to address the COVID-19 healthcare pandemic crisis. And you know we can certainly have more conversation about where we are as a state. Uh, Representative Romero and I as members of leadership have been in the command center and we've been uh, briefed on just how we're making decisions moving from red to orange, orange to yellow, potentially moving to green, and we can certainly answer questions related to the formula that's utilized for that. Um, the deployment of funds, I know there's been a lot of media related to funding, uh, the first $100 million that have been spent on this pandemic response. And then um, we've also had to respond to legislation related to un unemployment insurance 
on protections for businesses, protection for providers, I mean, liability uh, protection for them, uh, what happens to housing and business assistance beyond the SBA PPP programs and federal programs. So that's been kind of like a very multitude of issues in the last two months plus an initiative that we've been leading, Representative Romero, Representative Hans and myself, again, on the targeted pieces in collaboration, not only with the state, but also Salt Lake County and Salt Lake City, where we are addressing the issue of housing security and food security as we continue to increase the number of tests that we're doing in the co on the COVID-19 hotspots. So, I mean, that's an overall of what we've done. I will pass the time to Representative Romero. Maybe they can expand, but I'm happy to answer more specific questions. And then I can kind of cover what we've been doing with our community health workers. And then um, Representative Collins can kind of cover what she's been working on with the North, with um, concerns we have on North Temple in particular that impact all our communities. But um, outside of what um, Senator Escamilla pointed out, um, we received $250,000 in CARE Act funding. Um, we are partnering with the uh, Department of Health, with the Office of Health and Disparities. We've um, contracted with 16 nonprofits. We've hired, through those nonprofits, they have what we call um, community health workers. Those individuals are following up with people who are being tested to identify if there's any housing or um, food insecurity needs. And, and those community health workers, um, they just started last week. Sorry about that, I didn't know my phone was off. And uh, on. And from, from there, we're assessing those needs. We've been partnering with the county at, again and the city. And um, the county mayor was, is negotiating something with the Utah Food Bank. So if anyone goes through our testing facility, there's a need, they test positive, food boxes will be delivered to their home while they're um, being quarantined. And so that's a, that's a huge piece. We're also partnering with the city mayor's office and the county mayor's office to um, address any hygiene issues some people might have, whether it be diapers or whether it be um, person, other personal items. So we really wanted to take a, a grassroots approach about this. We didn't want to be the politician smiling, hey, here, we're, we're, this, this is what we're doing. We really wanted to utilize nonprofits that are, con are connected to what we call vulnerable com communities, which would be communities of color and, and other vulnerable populations. And so that they already have those connections to the communities. So people feel more comfortable getting tested and, and working with us on, on our project. So that's kind of been the bulk of um, mine and Senator Escamillas and Representative Holland's work. Um, our first big testing event, we had over 352 people um, attend. And I, for, it's 10 people were, were positive, correct? Uh, Senator Escamilla, out of the, the individuals we're testing. Um, Senator Escamilla has been in contact with um, the governor's office right now, and uh, one of our hotspots is West Valley, and that's part of mine and Senator Escamilla's district as well as on the west side of Salt Lake. And so we're working with them to do more testing in West Valley, and we're also in discussions with Salt Lake County of maybe hiring more community health workers, so we're um, reaching out to more community members. and. Is there anything I've left out loose or Senator or Representative Hollins? No, I don't think so. That sounds good. Okay, I'll turn the time over to Representative Hollins just when we're talking about COVID-19 and kind of some of the work and um, trends we're seeing even in our neighborhood. Okay, hello. So um, part of what I've been doing is working on um, what's been going on on North Temple. I'm sure many of you have been on North Temple and have seen the increase in um, people who are camping out, loitering uh, um, along North Temple. And so myself and I've been working with uh, Councilman Johnston, him and I have been talking um, back and forward because he also expressed some concerns about what was happening in the area. Um, and so I have been looking at how can we provide um, services to the individuals who are in that area, but also we know that there are individuals who are being um, released from the criminal justice system, those who are lower level offenders, um, but they're being released just back out on the streets. And so my concern is that, um, of course, that there's no resources. Um, there, there has to be some type of stopgap in between um, just being released to the, to the streets. So um, I've been speaking with um, some of the businesses, in particular, um, Liberty Taxes. 
um, the owner of that business and I have been um, talking back and forth um, because she's been having a lot of issues um, over in that area. So we've been trying to figure out how do we um, make sure that the businesses over in the area are still able to thrive um, on North Temple. And so I've been working with um, Chief Brown and with um, Major Red with the Highway Patrol um, to try and see what we can do. And part of their strategy has been, you know, we have people who are camping out who are experiencing homelessness and they have no place to go right now. And then we have those individuals who are preying on that population and, and they are reoffending. And so part of the strategy of what they've been looking at is how do we, um, those people who continue to be, who reoffend, who they are arresting and they're getting, because of C-19, they're immediately being turned over and back out on the street. What can they do with those individuals? And so um, they had said that there is a plan in place um, um, and they're looking at uh, what they can do. Part of what I've been doing is, is how do we get more resources to those individuals who need more resources, those individuals who need to be in treatment and those people who need um, mental health care. And so that's, that's one of my concerns, but that's, that's one of the things I've been working on and, um, and keeping in contact with the businesses over in that, in that area and making sure, like I said, that they still have businesses that's gonna thrive throughout this. And to kind of um, piggyback on that, this is gonna be challenging for us because I just met with, I, so each of us serve on the appropriation committee. Utah is very unique that every senator and every representative sits on an appropriation committee. So when we're dealing with the budget, we have appropriation meetings. When we're dealing with policy, we have standing committee meetings. And so I serve on executive offices and law enforcement. And so that covers kind of what Representative Hollins was talking about. We've asked our departments to do a 10% cut, a 5% cut, and a 2% cut. Our committees, and both um, Senator Escamilla and Representative Holland serve on social services, our committees are meeting next week. And so uh, we were sitting down with staff today um, on my lunch hour and, and trying to figure out, okay, what's being cut and how can we make sure that some essential services are not cut to the community with these budget cuts? Because uh, as you know, there's 75 members in the House and there's 29 members in the Senate and we all have different ideologies and um, we are in the minority, but that still doesn't mean we don't have a voice. And so I know um, Representative of Hollins and Senator Escamilla will probably be doing these with some of their committee members as well. So um, my committee hearing is going to be on Wednesday, theirs is on Tuesday. So we're, we're dealing with some um, su substantial cuts to programs that many of us care about and, and programs that we need as Representative Hollins talking about in regards to corrections and, and just staffing for DPS. So it's a challenging time right now and um, we're not really getting much sleep. I don't know if you to want to um, kind of piggyback on that as well. Uh, just so this exercise is that we don't have money. So of course, um, the structural imbalance that we've been addressing and you know, there's been different uh, proposals as you guys remember one was on um, on the you know, the tax reform piece that we took care of during the session to not you know, to kind of like repeal that thing that was passed during a special session. Um, I do want to just emphasize that there was legislation that removed the constitutional um, mandate to have all income tax go to education. And now that we're cutting all the budget by 10%, we need to cut that by 10%. There's not money. So our fiscal analyst office is saying you guys need to cut by 10%. Well, we just approved as of two months ago. So um, as you know, we go by fiscal years that start from July 1st. Uh, to June 30th and um, we're now at a point where in the next month we're gonna have to get ready to cut 10% of the budget that we just approved last two three months ago so just know that that exercise will start happening I was very vocal during the executive appropriations committee where representative Romero and I serve that having a blanket 10% is probably responsible especially in the middle of a pandemic to think that social services need to be cut we need to find the money somewhere else. Social services is already at bare bones and it's going to be a very difficult process, but um, we are expecting, so just as we are aware, the CARES Act funds that came are all COVID-19 related only. That means we can only use them, those funds for that specific response piece. 
and it's money that you use. If you don't use it, you return it to the federal government by December 31st. So um, we're talking in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but it, they have to be utilized for COVID-19. And with that, I think we're open for questions and see if we can clarify. There's been a lot of things happening the last three months, that's for sure. And this is just a reminder, you will have to unmute yourself to ask a question. Did we scare everybody? <laughs> no questions? <laughs> I'm surprised. Nothing. I, I have a question. What do you think, where do you think they're going to try to make the cuts, that 10% cut? What do you think the legislature will do? So <clears throat> historically, and I, I was there in 2009 when we went through this exercise. Um, so I've been there. And, and, it, and, they, and in fairness, when I say they, meaning the majority tries to go and have a this blanket all the committees go together and we're going to cut in this you know all of them the same percentages oh. i have to say that probably i mean i don't recommend that and i'm gonna really oppose that process just because we can't cut social services when you're in the middle of a pandemic that just is kind of like counter it makes no sense my biggest fear is we're gonna have to go after education and after the change in the constitutional amendment that's probably the like the most dangerous place to go the reality is that education you know we were seeing this really high increase on income taxes which goes to education that's why we had all that funds extra for that six percent that we gave of increase to wpu this last session mm -hmm. that's going to be cut the problem is when we have a, when we hit a recession the first thing that goes down is income tax right because those are the, those are the taxes based on salaries and wages so i'm <clears throat> <clears throat> it worries me a lot because now that constitutional piece is removed. It's coming to the, by the way, it's coming to the voters to in the ballot. So you will be, because it is a constitutional amendment. So I hope people really, just so you know, full disclosure, I voted against those. Um, even though the education community was supporting it based on this agreement of the 6% increase on WPU. But my concern was without knowing that we were going to be facing a huge pandemic, that even if we commit right now two years from now you have a different legislature right so i'm i'm really concerned and to answer your question i'm hoping that we focus on some of the infrastructure and stop infrastructure development for a couple of years until we get everything stabilized and that's what i think um personally will be um, advocating for social services cannot be cut we can't touch medicaid expansion we can, i mean that is where we need to put all of our of our funds so we can continue growing and our economy will not it's not going to grow if we don't have healthy communities right i mean you know if people are dying it won't matter if you have a strong economy it just makes no sense so I, that's a good question historically um they've always done in charlotte they've always done this oh everyone does it all, all committees come in and and but already they're pe talking about cutting medicaid cutting um, the programs for, for children on health. I mean, that's just, that's the scariest thing. And Representative Romero, I mean, Collins and myself serve on social services. So that's where you have Department of Worker mm -hmm. Services, housing, homelessness, you know, health, human services, so child protective services, DCFS. And Representative Romero would serve on, on executive offices and <clears throat> law enforcement. They have all the public safety piece, corrections, uh, you know, prison, the state prison, the county jail. So those critical pieces and then you have education right i mean we can leave yeah. education uh that's the future so you know it's it, it's going to be an interesting exercise but i they usually the the trend is we go and cut everyone at the same level okay also if anyone has any ideas for bills where we're, we um they opened up for us to file bills um last week and um, I tend to not try to run many bills since I'm in leadership. So I usually run two or uh, this year, I'm going to try to just stick to three or four versus five to 10, like I did last time. So if, if you have any ideas and you're, or you're thinking about that, approach one of us. And if we say it's not our area of expertise, we can refer you to someone else. This is the time to be talking to us um, for the 2001 legislative session. Um, this is the time we start planning um, what we're going to run for legislation and what we're going to do. So although we're dealing with the pandemic right now and we're, we're 
probably going to have another special session in June and July to deal with kind of how where we move forward with that. We're also um, preparing for the upcoming session. And um, so now's the time to approach us if, if you're interested in particular topics and want to see um, legislation. Just uh, <clears throat> I would like to add, because some of the questions is, how is the state moving, you know, this color coding of uh, moving from orange, you know, to yellow, to um, red, you know, when we're in red, my understanding is there is um, a big push by the business community to move us to green by in the next couple of weeks. Salt Lake City, as you know, had stays in orange as well as West Valley City. But I, you know, it's, it's, I'm seeing a lot and I, I you know, I just got a, a, a private message. I mean, more people are relaxed. You see that, you know, hardly anyone, you know, unless you're the employee, an employee and entities, they, people are not wearing the masks. So we were talking and we are strategizing doing some outreach educational piece and maybe in West Valley, we could probably bring it to Salt Lake City if it works and, and try to do some of that work with Representative Romero and other leaders in different areas. But what, just so you guys know, the formula they're using, and by the way, the governor released his document today. You, it's public, it's like 15 pages. That explains the whole, uh, how the state of Utah is moving and, and doing this whole process to get them back, you know, to normal, whatever that is. Uh, but, so you guys know most of the, one of the biggest drives that makes that determination is a formula they have created and it's based on how much PPP, PPE we have ready. So how, <clears throat> how well are we equipped <clears throat> to respond to, to the pandemic, which by the way, Utah is in the top five of having all the equipment ready. So, you know, the, the executive branch has done a good job in getting all of our equipment ready, meaning ventilators, um, masks, I mean, gloves, all of this PPP, PPE um, equipment. The other part is that the, our number of, hospital, of people in hospital related to COVID-19 and the use of ICU unit beds for that. So the lower our ICU unit bed usage is, then we can, that's how you start reducing, you know, moving from one color to another. Uh, at this, as of two weeks ago, or a week and a half ago, we were at 12%. I think that has increased since we did the shift. And I can guarantee you we're going to have a spike on our numbers. That's just, it's going to happen. So the question is, as we spike, is how do we, you know, how do we, how much are we going to spike? And can we keep the trend at a specific number? And testing is critical. So you're going to continue seeing some, all of us pushing the testing component. But if, <clears throat> if you're going to allow people to have the tools to isolate correctly and quarantine correctly, even if we're testing, we're not stopping the spread. And the reality is, west of i-15 our 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 numbers are just so high compared to anyone else in the state of utah that is is really really literally um killing people right in our community so i you're you're gonna see a, a different maybe approach from legislators on the west side pushing for more um, caution way of of opening and moving us towards normal because we're seeing it you know i I tell the story of my conversation with a member of leadership that represents rural Utah. And his argument was, he was telling me, it's like, Luz, I have in one, in my county, four ca positive cases. And I'm like, that's my household. I had four positive cases in my house. And if it, that's not telling how, you know, people are obviously relating to this in a different way based on their experiences. Clearly it, I can tell you that it's, um, it's difficult and it's very, just it could happen to anyone clearly and and you know from children to to adults and we just need to be more careful because our communities are getting hit disproportionately so um <clears throat> you know it's we're in those meetings when we try to speak up as much as we can please know that and we're here to listen and we want to hear what ideas you may have to be more responsive and i appreciate people have been you know like messaging right now because the assessment is correct it, you see this sense of oh we're back to normal we're not and our numbers are not that low and we just had a big spike in the last week so you know connect with us via text or email i'm we really appreciate feedback it makes a big difference
I just wanted to add one more thing. So I, I ran legislation this session with Senator Hinkins to do a Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women Task Force. Um, I also serve on the Native American, I'm Native American and Latina. A lot of people don't know that. I also serve on the Native American Legislative um, Committee it's a, and it's made up of legislators. And so I'm working with Senator Hinkins right now who represents San Juan County. And so we'll be doing some big announcements and kind of talking about what we are doing as a legislature to have, help the Navajo Nation. And so you'll be hearing about that within the next two weeks. Um, we'll be down in San Juan County and unveiling some of the work we're doing down there because outside of New York and New Jersey, the Navajo Nation has been hit the hardest and the numbers are very high for um, our Utah piece of the, uh, the reservation you know, sits on in New Mexico and Arizona and Utah and, and Utah's being hit extremely I mean we're suffering right now so um, I'll be I'll give Turner that information so he can send out to people if you want to donate or um, um, you know assist with some of our efforts that we're doing down there but we'll be announcing our task force and who's going to be on our task force and we'll be talking about what we've done as a legislature to address um, some of the uh, the crisis there on the Navajo Nation actually the legislature has really stepped up and Senator Hinkins was able to secure about $2 million to, to go that way so that we're making sure we're protecting all Utahns. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next section of the agenda. Um, I would encourage you if you have follow-up questions to use the chat function, you can actually ask uh, either the representatives or Senator Escamilla uh, questions on chat privately as well. Uh, with that, we'll move on to, to Council Member Johnston. Uh, thanks, Turner. I actually just sent you an email with an update on the water park. I can give a quick uh, response to that. Uh, thank you, um, Representative, um, all of you actually, for the updates. Um, it, it's It's been very difficult uh, on the west side, uh, Salt Lake and West Valley, obviously, and the numbers bear that out. And I think we're stuck in a predicament, as many of you may experience, um, with many who are laid off right now, um, who are struggling that way, who are struggling with the health um, consequences of COVID. Um, there's not a, a sort of a win-win here, it's just tough. And so I um, wanna make sure we're getting the resources out. So I appreciate everything y'all have done. Um, senators and representatives, you've been great. Um, Representative Hollins did mention North Temple. Uh, a real quick issue there, she hit the major parts of it. One of the things in the city we're dealing with is um, the unsheltered homeless population. Uh, we, we've known we needed more shelter beds to be inside. We had an emergency shelter over the winter in Sugar House where we had up to 150 individuals plus those in motels and things we're helping out with. Um, with COVID though, the problem with having a shelter like that is that you can't socially distance in there. And so opening up another overflow with that type proximity with that number of people in a short in a small space was really counterproductive to keeping people healthy and safe. Um, and so best practices nationally have been to help people who are okay staying outside to socially distance there and offer resources that way, um, which you can all understand is a catch 22, right? Um, so Volunteers of America's Run Street Outreach, the city has worked with them and the County Health Department to provide more outreach on the streets, uh, along the river, foothills, all the places that folks tend to camp, um, to provide medical outreach, resources, all those kind of needs. Um, but the reality is with, with a lot of the um, public facilities shut down, like libraries and community centers, um, bathrooms are where, that's where the homeless would go for bathrooms during the daytime, to be off the streets, um, to be inside. Those are not available right now. So we're seeing probably um, visibly more folks on the, on the streets. North Temple itself is not necessarily unsheltered homeless. Um, there's a wide variety of folks down there, um, heavily impacted like Representative Holland said from the jail and the restrictions they're struggling with there. Um, homeless providers themselves have had to restrict access to some of the buildings because they're just so packed. Um, it's not healthy that way. So, there's a lot of factors sort of the storm that's brought everyone to where we're at today. Um, we're still working with the mayor's office at least three days and sometimes four days a week to figure out how to keep working on this. 
and uh, really hoping, hoping, hoping we can move through this pandemic as quickly and safely as possible for everybody, um, particularly before the winter time. So um, that's an update on that homeless piece. North Temple, uh, they are going to get more cleaning going on. Uh, so between 7th West and uh, the river, really, they'll have Advantage Services does outdoor cleaning in places across the city. They're going to be doing that uh, those three days a week there, at least. Um, I know the police, uh, both UHP and Salt Lake City, are um, trying to help out there more and get the criminal element um, a little more uh, tamped down. Um, but it's tough, um, just understandably. The second piece is about the um, water parks, formerly known as Raging Waters and or Seven Peaks. Uh, as many of you know, we had an operator scheduled last year to open it and it fell through, mostly because it's so expensive to rehabilitate the property at this point. The estimates right now range from 20 to $25 million to, um, to fix, upgrade and reopen the place. Uh, we, a lot of you know that it was run down for a lot of years. Um, it's probably worse off than anybody's understood. And so um, the best estimates from the private indiv individuals looking at it have been around there. Uh, so what's happening immediately is we've had three fires there in recent months. We've also had a rash of break-ins, not just the homeless sometimes. This is a lot of teenagers in the last month or so. Uh, there is a, a pretty popular video on TikTok about uh, kids going down the slides themselves, uh, which some of which are probably not in the best condition to do that. Um, and so there's been a, a lot of activity around there. The mayor's office is going to request from the city council funding for 24 hour security in the next couple of weeks uh, to have uh, private security on site um, going forward through the summertime. And then we also need some more weed control and things around there to uh, watch the fire danger, those kind of things. Um, as far as the future of the park, uh, it was built with federal funds, and one of the restrictions was it had to be used for outdoor recreation going forward, and so it was rezoned as open space. It still is rezoned as that, so you can't develop it necessarily, um, other than, say, park-like features. Um, and so there's a desire from the mayor's office, this came up about six months ago as well, a desire to go to the public and get public feedback and input about what we'd like to see there. I strongly encourage that to happen sooner than later. Um, my personal view is I think if we have a park, it's gonna have to be a regional park that has amenities we don't see somewhere else. Um, and accompanying that, we've gotta find a better way to fund parks maintenance in the city. We just don't. Uh, and so you see a lot of the issues we'll see this summer, particularly with the, uh, the budget being tighter. Um, it's hard to maintain the parks at the level we, uh, we need them to be at. So. Uh, the sort of two pieces. One is a general parks funding discussion at the city level about how we're going to do that going forward and the structure of oversight for that. The second piece is what does the community want to see in that space um, on the park? You'll know there's a hill there. Uh, there's some infrastructure we could use to change into a new park. It would be expensive to tear it down, um, but it's expensive either way. Um, personally, ideally, I'd love a water park there if we could keep it affordable for the residents here. I'm just not sure that that's economically feasible at this point. Um, the amount of money you'd have to get to reopen the park would have to be recouped somehow, uh, unless the city is bonded for it and then there's a maintenance issue. So that's sort of where that's sitting at right, right now. Um, we're also in the middle of the budget cycle and from the city end of things, we do expect the tax revenues will drop probably by up to 30% before now and Christmas just a rough guesstimate we're making at this point. Um, and sales tax is a big part of the funding for the city. So the mayor's presented a balanced budget on her end. City council is reviewing it right now to see um, if it's something we can live with for the next six months to a year. Um, a lot of the savings are based on us having some surplus in our um, general fund, which was smart to keep that. Um, it's also based on not filling currently open positions, which means uh, we probably won't see service levels go up for different things in the city, um, but we also won't see layoffs and those kind of things. However, um, as the, uh, the state representatives and senators said, um, the state's going to have to reevaluate their budget, and that could impact us as soon as November, December this year, so we'll have to revisit that as a city.
And Andrew, at that in particular, when we're looking at um, Operation Rio Grande and, and the number of officers that, and that's my committee and the number of officers that we've funded in the past to help the city. And um, even though I wasn't a big fan of Operation Rio Grande, the extra law enforcement I know was a, a asset to some of the stuff we were trying to do in the city. And so I don't, I don't know if those will be funded. They're, they're on the chopping block of the information I was looking at today. Yeah, I would I would not be surprised at all if there's no funding for that anymore going forward. And once um, I get so. that list, um, um, Councilman, I'm sorry, I called you Andrew, but Councilman, when I when I get that that list, I will make sure that I email it to you and um and Representative Hollins and and Senator Escamilla and probably um Councilman jo um Councilman Rogers as well. So maybe before I um before our meeting on Wednesday, you guys, you can give me some input on some of your thoughts just so I can kind of get a feel for where you all are at. Cool. Thank you. Um, uh, good things. There are some parks funding still happening. This is the uh, Three Creeks Confluence Park is going in. I'm sure you hear about that in a bit. And then uh, there's also funding for the boat docks along the Jordan River, some two new ones, I believe, at this point. Um, and those should be designed and going forward as well. Um, oh, the last piece that uh, impacts us a little bit if you go to West High School is the third north uh, pedestrian overpass over the train tracks. Um, I believe it's fully funded and in the latter stages of design. Um, I don't have an ETA about the build of it at this point, um, but it is fully funded and moving forward uh, as the Folsom Trail corridor is also in the final stages of design. I believe UTA is running that one. All right, we have time for maybe one question for Andrew, or Councilman Member Johnston, sorry. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Andrew. I have one comment, no, not a question. Sure. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in Andrew's ear quite frequently complaining about the condition of the Nine Line Trail. And I've got to say that it's amazing right now and it's getting better every week. And people are using it a lot. And the amazing, same, thing, huh? same thing with the Three Creeks. It's it it looks like it's something that should belong on the east side, not not the west side. It's great. Thank you. No, it belongs on the west side. And I <laughs> I, I, I walk that trail every day and bike it. So thank you, Andrew. I'll, I'll disagree with you, Jeremy. It belongs on the west side. It's too good for the east side. <laughs> All right. But anyway, that's it. Good. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the mayor's office. Josh. Hey everyone. Uh, thanks, Turner. Um, apologies, you can't see me. Uh, camera's not working right now. Anyway, um, so I'm the uh, community liaison in the mayor's office uh, for districts one and two for the west side. Um, so just a couple things I wanted to go over. I don't have uh, too much to say that hasn't been um, gone over by our legislators and by uh, Councilman um, Johnston. So as you heard, the uh, the budget process is currently um, in swing. Uh, we do encourage you all to um, participate in that process. You can do that by <clears throat> going online, uh, going to the city council website. There's um, plenty of opportunity there to give feedback and to participate in the, in the public meetings on that. Um, even though it may be harder, uh, of course, for those who don't have internet access, but there is a call-in um, uh, option there as well for council meetings. So we encourage you to uh, continue to be involved as much in, as in city uh, processes as you can as they continue to move forward. Um, one of the initiatives going on right now that you may have seen or heard about is the uh, Open Streets, uh, stay, stay Safe, Stay Active Streets Program um, initiative, which is currently here on the west side in 500 North, and uh, just this week on Emory Street from 3rd South down to 940 South, which is uh, also called Hayes Avenue. Um, and that is gonna be in place um, at least for, you know, as long as we're in this orange phase and depending on how people are, you know, are responding to it. And really the purpose of it is to allow people to get out and exercise, to walk and bike, 
and to be able to have that distance that's being encouraged and you know be able to walk on the road or bike on the road without having to worry as much about cars uh, the only traffic that would be allowed on those roads is just local traffic people that live on the street or need to access a business that might be on that street so based on the feedback we've gotten so far on the streets that uh, it's in place right now um, it's been mostly positive but we had definitely it varies by area um, one of the streets on the east side in Sugar House, uh, Stratford Avenue, that one has had a number of negative experiences with pedestrians and drivers and cyclists not really getting along. But uh, uh, based on what I've heard, I, I know that 500 North does have that problem at times too, and there's part of the road that's a little narrow that makes it a little tougher. Um, but overall, this is sort of an experimental thing, and we're hoping that people are going to like it, and um, we're working with transportation to to um, make sure that we get good public input on that. Um, so yeah, if you have any comments on that um, initiative, just feel free to share it with me, share it in the chat, um, or just contact our office. Uh, the other item I had to share here, I'm sorry, I lost my spot. Oh, on a, on a lighter note, um, the city is, redesigning its city flag. So currently until June 30th, uh, people are uh, allowed, residents, anyone can submit a design for a new flag for the city. Um, and you can go to just slc.gov slash flag. And so the submission period ends on June 30th. I, from what I've heard, there's been you know well over a hundred submissions already from a number of people, a number of places from within the city and outside of the city and even outside of the state. <laughs> um, and so that will be going on through June 30th. So if you have any time, if you're an artist, creative minded and want to have an idea for the flag for the city, um, that's available to you. Um, and we are continuing to, um, you know, connect with community council to make sure that they have the information that they need to share with you all, um, either be it through Facebook, through email, um, encouraging these meetings like we're having right now and encourage you just to get in contact with our office. We're here um, to answer whatever questions you might have, problems you're having in your neighborhood, um, and we're, we're here to help. Uh, any questions for, for me, for our for mayor's office? Thanks, Josh. Great. Thanks, and uh, encourage you to visit slc.gov slash mayor. There's a lot of information there. Um, we put a lot of information there from the county health website and from the state uh, coronavirus page to kind of have a centralized uh, spot there to get information. We have currently information on what exactly the moderate or orange level means and how that different difference from, from yellow and what that means for the, for the city at this time. Um, so yeah, we're uh, hoping that despite the digital divide and we were able to get as much information out to people that need it. But thanks. Thanks. Um, we're going to do one quick change on the agenda really quick. Eric had a couple of updates that he wanted to make uh, in the middle of the meeting and then we're going to move into the Three Creeks confluence. So one of the things I, the only thing I wanted to kind of say during the middle of this meeting is if you live in Poplar Grove and want to get involved in local community improvements or within the community itself, please send me a private message in the chat and I will get you hooked up. We're looking for people to kind of join our board and kind of help Poplar Grove um, kind of just expand and become better. So again, if you live in Poplar Grove, feel free to reach out to me in the Zoom chat. I would love to get you on our board. I would love to talk to you about opportunities we have and some of the projects we have going on. So thank you. And then we will move on to Tyler and Brian talking about Three Creeks Confluence. Great, thanks Turner. Um, so kind of the plan, I guess, um, I'm gonna do kind of a little introduction, background on the project, uh, and then Tyler will do a uh, update about the project. Uh, and then we'll kind of touch on some future plans for programming and activating the site. 
Um, so my name's Brian, uh, and I'm the director of the Seven Canyons Trust. Uh, Tyler, and I saw Katie uh, on the chat. Do you want to just jump in and introduce yourselves quick? Yeah, I'm Tyler Murdoch, and I'm the project manager for the Three Creeks Confluence Project from uh, Salt Lake City Parks and Public Lands. Hi, guys. I'm Katie. I'm with Trails and Natural Lands, and I am the volunteer outreach and education coordinator for TNL. Thanks, guys. Uh, so, kind of a little background on our organization. Uh, the Seven Canyons Trust is a, a nonprofit working to uncover and restore the buried and impaired streams uh, that flow through the Salt Lake Valley. Uh, and kind of one of our, our first efforts um, is what's called the Three Creeks Confluence. Uh, so this is the site at which uh, Red Butte emigration and Parley's Creeks all spill into the Jordan River. Um, it's roughly 13th south and 9th west uh, in the Glendale community. Uh, currently the creeks are, are fully buried. Um, so as of, you know, maybe two or three months ago, uh, you might not have seen any sort of progress going on, any construction. Uh, now the, the ground has been broken on the project and uh, you may be kind of wondering what's going on. Um, so this is an effort that our organization actually originally proposed uh, back in 2014 uh, as students actually at the University of Utah. Uh, and we took the project uh, to the city and kind of presented our vision um, and they basically took it, took it over and, and helped to kind of champion the project uh, and kind of move it forward. Uh, so that kind of led us on a, prog uh, a progress to do um, a few community workshops where we gathered feedback from you all uh, to create some design visions, a final design, um, and then some construction plans. Uh, so Tyler, do you want to give a quick update on plans and progress? Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Brian. Um, I, I won't provide much of a background since Brian's already done that, but uh, we're happy to have a project partner and community partner like Seven Canyons Trust uh, work with the city to develop this site and uh, appreciate the words from uh, Jeremy about the development of uh, Three Creeks and finally seeing some activity. I think I came to the Glendale Community Council uh, back the first time in like February, March of 2016. So, you know, we're going on four and a half years of talking about Three Creeks and planning and trying to fundraise for it. Um, it's not unusual for a, a project of this size, but it's really exciting to come back to the community council in somewhat unusual circumstances, but to uh, finally book and ground on the project. And, uh, that happened back in January, maybe February of this year. And if you've been out on the Parkway Trail or driven along 900 West, you've seen the activity and the construction trucks uh, that are actively coming from the site. So we are moving quickly on the project uh, and we anticipate having the project fully complete by the end of September. Uh, so we've run into a couple of minor issues with the bridges and uh, getting those installed and having to fabricate some new things on the bridges over the next few weeks. Um, but we're still hoping to have uh, some, some sort of grand opening in September. I'm not sure what that's going to look like quite yet with uh, these these times, but we will definitely be coming out to the community over the next few months to help plan something for that event. Um, just a couple other minor things that will be coming out over the next few weeks. The community council was approached several um, probably a year ago by the public uh, Salt Lake City Arts Council to have some public art for the Three Creeks Confluence project. We've been working on various designs for that, um, and we are just about ready to issue a call for public art that will be released next week. Uh, and so we're going to be soliciting uh, anywhere from six to 20 local artists to come up with some designs that will be installed on one of the new pedestrian bridge at the Three Creeks Convos project. Um, so it's a really unique opportunity to engage the community. And I just want to bring that up here today to help spread the word. If you know any local artists, um, it's going to be a really cool project, and I'm really excited how it's turning out. And so that we should see that call next week. I'll send that to you, Turner, uh, so you can share that with the community as well. Um, well. I think that's really all I have with regards to updates. Uh, many of you will be seeing the bridge that is down there on the Jordan Parkway Trail right now. Uh, so 
that will be installed in the coming weeks. Um, and we've been taking regular aerial photography and video. And I'll go ahead and post a link on the chat right now. If you haven't been on the city's website, uh, we have a, a drone that's been going out monthly to, uh, to film that. So I'll share that with the group. Great. Thanks, Tyler. Um, so moving into kind of our, our plans for uh, programming, um, I've been working really closely with Katie um, at the city to help create uh, basically a five-year programmatic plan. Um, and the goal of the programmatic plan is to basically activate uh, the site with weekly activities uh, with the goal of um, preventing unwant unwanted activities by kind of getting eyes down there, activity down there, um, to help with the, the city's maintenance load. Um, some of the events will include, you know, regularly scheduled volunteer efforts um, and to really educate people and, and get people excited about the efforts and uh, kind of the, the intention of the, the project. Uh, so basically um, what we're asking is, is for the community to help us achieve um, these goals. Uh, and I think it's going to be um, hopefully a, a close partnership uh, with the community to, to help us schedule activities. And so what I'm kind of asking you guys is to um, both provide us with organizations, activities um, that could be accomplished at the site. Um, if you know organizations that are doing activities along the Jordan River, um, like, you know, the Tracy Avery doing education along the Jordan River, um, let us know uh, what's going on and uh, we're hoping to kind of move some of those activities uh, down to this site um, to utilize the site. Um, and then also, uh, if you're interested in, in scheduling an activity, um, you know, whether that's hosting uh, a picnic down there, um, you know, coming out for a walking tour of the site, uh, doing a volunteer project, um, let us know. Uh, we're, we're really working to kind of develop a, a list of uh, both potential partners and, and activities. Uh, so as I mentioned, our goal is to have uh, basically 50 activities a year, which would be about uh, one every week. Um, it's likely and, and hopefully that we get more than that, um, but that's, that's kind of our, our goal to achieve. Uh, and then to develop kind of two to three uh, marquee events. Uh, and those are kind of larger events, you know, they could be concerts, uh, they could be, uh, you know, a dance series. Um, they could definitely be kayaking tours, thanks Charlotte. Um, so kind of community celebrations, um, larger events that will really draw a larger crowd. Obviously that's really challenging right now, um, as you might imagine. Uh, with COVID-19. So, um, you know, we're, we're being really sensitive to um, what the pro programming looks like and, and, you know, kind of preventing large groups from gathering down there. Um, but we're really looking at kind of a five-year um, timeline. And so one of the things that, you know, <laughs> thanks, Charlotte. <laughs> um, um, so one of the things that uh, I know Turner and I have been talking about is doing, you know, a big kind of Glendale community celebration down there. Um, and so that's kind of one of the examples of um, some stuff that we're, we're pursuing, um, but we're really looking uh, to you guys to, to really help us um, program the site. So uh, whether you're throwing stuff in the chat, thank you, Charlotte, um, or emailing us, um, and Turner can share my contact and, and Tyler and Katie's contact information. Uh, but we're hopeful that the community really um, takes stewardship over this project. And um, it was really nice to hear that, you know, this seems like a project for the East side, but you guys really deserve it. So um, with that, anything else, Tyler, Katie? I uh, just w one final comment re with regards to programming. Um, you know, I think we're really going to be leaning on Brian and Seven Canyons Trust to help us develop this plan moving forward. But I think that's going to be critical to have community input and buy-in on this project. And I think we've done a, a good job of um, 
really engaging the community early on in this project. That's how we got through a lot of the design um, and the ideas for the project as we move forward. So we look forward to getting more ideas on how we can uh, celebrate and have fun and recreate at this new space uh, over the coming years. Yeah, well, well said, Brian and Tyler. And, and to add on to that, again, suggestions for organizations or individuals who could really help us uh, listen to the community and pull in the right programming that represents uh, what those in the areas want to see and to celebrate and do would be incredibly helpful as well. Um, yeah, and I'd just like to add really quickly from the Glendale perspective, this ties into the survey that we've had regarding the urban tree house. Um, and I apologize to Jeremy, Ashley, and Latu. I haven't had a chance to email you an update, but this literally all came together today. We will be getting a, a senior from the University of Utah to do a capstone project with us. And Glendale is gonna kick off a kind of master planning exercise, not a community master plan, but just a neighborhood strategic plan for the community council that can tie the urban tree house with the three creeks and all these cool projects we've got um, to kind of create a strategic plan for the community council um, moving forward to kind of incorporate and how we can do events and activities and all these different things that are happening. Um, Katie can attest that this all came together in the last couple of hours because uh, we've been Zoom champions today. <laughs> um, but I'll talk more about that toward the end. It also incorporates, as Jeremy said in the chat, the Keep Glendale Beautiful chapter that we're starting. Um, so there's a lot of cool opportunities. And I, like I said, I'll talk about it more at the end um, so I don't take up time right now. But are there questions for Brian, Tyler, or Katie? Turner, if I might just say one quick thing. I know that Andrew brought up a lot, uh, several other projects and I wish I had 40 minutes to talk about other projects that we have coming on in the west side, um, but we're trying to keep our website updated. So if you have questions about things that Andrew referenced, um, please check our website. I'm happy to come back next month and provide updates on those projects. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Is there, are there fish that actually come th in the creeks and that will feed into the Jordan River? Yes, there are. Um, I don't know if they've done fishing surveys at that location specifically, um, but I know it is an area where um, trout will actually get washed down in, in big rain events and um, they're either not willing or not capable of, of swimming back upstream through the, the culvert. Um, you know, the, the four or five miles it goes. Um, mm -hmm. So there are trout, um, there's, there's plenty of carp, which um, you, if you go down there, you can visibly see because the water is so clear. Um, so it is, it is, in my experience, um, one of the, if not the most fish spots along the Jordan River, uh, which is really interesting because, you know, up until, um, you know, two months ago, it was essentially an abandoned parking lot um, with no infrastructure there. So it is a very, very popular fishing spot. But now it's become a fishing spot since you've done some construction? Yeah, so part, oh. of, the, part of the project um, is to create uh, kind of a, a bridge span um, from the east and west sides of mm -hmm. the new uh, creek channel. Um, so the project will create about 200 feet um, of newly restored creek channel, uh, which will be basically the waters of Red Butte emigration and Parleys. Uh, and then that bridge um, will basically span that creek channel. Um, there will also be another bridge from the project site across the Jordan River um, to the Jordan River Trail on the other side. Uh, mm -hmm. But the bridge across the creeks is really intended to be um, kind of a, a, a fishing pier and, and mm -hmm. allow people to, to kind of put a line in and, and access yeah. the creek channels. One other question about water quality. Um, will you be monitoring water quality there? And I mean, are, are the creeks generally cleaner than the Jordan River or do that, does it carry a lot of um, pollutants? I'll, I'll speak to that real quickly. That's a great question, Charlotte. Um, we, the University of Utah has had a water quality uh, testing system there for several years. 
Um, that has been removed right now during construction, but we will be working with them to get that back uh, following construction. Um, and it's a, it is one of the major inputs for uh, water quality testing within Salt Lake City. And the, the organization that, that programs that um, is IUTAH. So if you go to IUTAH.org, um, you can actually see uh, the water quality data that's, that's coming out of the culvert there. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm going to move on to the next item on the agenda. I would, again, encourage you to use the chat function if there are additional things that come up. Um, we're going to move on to the North Temple Project. Jeff. Yeah, thanks. Good evening. Uh, thank you to uh, Turner and Eric for squeezing me into the agenda. I know you guys have a busy evening uh, this evening. I'm assuming everybody can hear me and see me okay. If not, just put something in the in the chat. So as Turner mentioned, uh, my name is Jeff. I'm with the city's transportation division. Uh, I'm here to give you a brief presentation tonight about a um, concept for a restriping that we have for North Temple. And this is the west side of North Temple over near the um, over near the the airport and I think I think I'm going to try to share my screen you guys bear with me for one second here so hopefully you guys are now seeing a Google Earth image here of um, North Temple so the North Temple that I'm referring to is the northern section of North Temple here not the new North Temple with the tracks in it but the asphalt North Temple um, <clears throat> Now I admit that uh, this area is outside of the Glendale Community Council. Um, let me switch back to myself here. Oh. Oh. Well, I, I'm not sure how to get back to myself, but uh, you guys are still seeing the screen, right? Let me stop share over here. There we go. How's that? A little Hi. friendlier? Good. Um, so admittedly, this is a little bit outside of the Glendale Community Council area, but this is the northern border border to the Poplar Grove Community Council. So maybe some of the, those of you that are here from the Glendale Community Council, um, this might be a little bit out of your area. But this is an act, actually, this is a popular route for people biking uh, across the south side of the airport out to the Great Salt Lake area. So it's a, a pretty important piece of our uh, infrastructure. The reason that we're looking at this right now is because the city's streets division is going to be resurfacing this road this summer. When the streets division resurfaces a road, they come in and they put a seal on the top of the road. In this case, they're gonna put what's called the slurry seal on top of the road. And it's just a thin, um, it's a thin sealant that helps to prolong the life and the, the quality of the asphalt. Well, when the streets division does these types of projects, it gives us in the transportation division an opportunity to take a look at the roadway and see if there are any minor striping changes that we can make to the roadway. So we've done that with this section of North Temple. This section of North Temple is in the pedestrian uh, and bicycle master plan as receiving bike lanes. So. As part of our evaluation, we looked to see if we could fit bike lanes onto the roadway, and this roadway is really wide. So we are able to put bike lanes uh, on this roadway and still maintain all of the other characteristics of the roadway that are still there. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen again to show you a concept. I'll go to screen two, and then hopefully here you guys are seeing uh, a concept uh, of what uh, the road would look like after implementation of this project. So as I mentioned, the road is really wide. So we would be able to maintain the parking on street as it currently is. We'd be able to maintain the one travel lane in each direction as well as the center turn lane. Um, the road is so wide, we could still keep that angle parking there along the Northrop Grumman facilities as well as on the other side of 2200 West in front of that, uh, that hotel. So this represents the layout where you have on street parking uh, what we call a buffered bike lane, a striped buffered bike lane. So you'd have yeah. your bike lane, and then you'd have a short stripe, uh, a, a narrow stripe there. Yeah, if we're not seeing the the shared screen. Oh, you're not seeing the shared screen. Were you looking at me the whole time? Yeah, and you're very friendly. <laughs> it wasn't great. Well, I appreciate that, but I wasn't looking at you. I was looking over at the screen, so that seemed a little bit unprofessional of me. So I apologize for that. Um, 
it's amazing how many Zoom videos you sit through every day. And I think who was mentioning it, uh, Brian was mentioning it, or Eric, you were mentioning it. Um, but you don't often get to run the controls like I have to here on the fly. So I apologize for that. Now you're seeing it, right? Yep. All right. So this is the this is the layout. This is the layout that we would have in front of the 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 Northrop Grumman facilities are here to the south. You can kind of see uh, in the gray there behind it is the existing conditions where that angle on street parking there is on the on the south side of the road. So this is what the road would look like on this side of 2200 West. Might be a little choppy for you as I scroll over, but I'll pause a little bit to let the let the everything resettle. Again, this is what it would look like on the uh, east side. I maybe I misspoke earlier. This is what it would look like on the east side of 2200 West. Again, it would maintain that same area um, with the striping pattern that's there. So um, the aim tonight was to share this concept with you. Um, we have received concepts, uh, we've received comments on our concepts throughout uh, this project, um, but I wanted to share this with you tonight uh, just to see if there are any other comments that you have. I can take comments, I can take questions. I'm also going to throw our, um, our email address up onto the chat as well as the project webpage. The hope for this project is that we get this implemented this summer. So Streets Division will be out there resurfacing this road in the July timeframe. We really hope to be able to implement this at that time. There are a couple of little hiccups that we're working on on our end to try to get all of the contractors that we need on board in a timely fashion. So we're really hopeful that we can do that for implementation this summer. I am going to stop sharing the screen now so that I can see the chat window and I will come down here and put the Email address. If you have any comments or any questions about that, uh, street resurfacing at slcgov.com. Street resurfacing at slcgov.com. That's there in the chat window. Uh, go ahead and send us an email. And I'll also throw in the uh, website for the project. So the images that I have just shown you are all available on that website as well. So um, that's all I have for tonight. So a couple of minutes to spare. Uh, Turner, Eric, I'll, I'll give it back to you guys if you want to look for questions or move on, that's okay with me too. Uh, any questions? What is the timeline for comments? Uh, in about a week or so. Okay. All right, thank you, Jeff. Okay, thank you guys, have a great rest of your meeting. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the Wasatch Mountain Institute. Hello everyone, um, thumbs up if you can hear me and see me. Um, my name is Hilary Lambert and I thank you so much for having me here this evening. Um, I am the program associate at the Wasatch Mountain Institute and I have our two initiators, Jack Shea and Wayne Turner and our program director, Howie Voter, I'm here listening in as well. Um, we're pleased to be joining you. Um, for those of you that are in Glendale, um, we are gonna speak on a project that is more in the Poplar Grove area, but um, as we've heard from a few different uh, folks this evening, this west side area that is adjacent to the Jordan River is truly connected. I mean, Brian's group is working with the aviary site down south in Mill Creek, and so are we. Uh, and so, so even though, um, and the exact boundaries of our property uh, that we're gonna show you about tonight are in the Fair Park uh, Community Council District, but it's all related and it's connected. Um, and so I have a short presentation to share with you about uh, the Wasatch Mountain Institute and a vision that we have for Utah that in part uh, is for Salt Lake City. So I will just uh, share my screen. Thumbs up if you can see that now. Um, and I will get going. Um, so the mission of the Wasatch Mountain Institute is to bring recreation and education for all uh, in an equitable context uh, to the mountains near home. And we are building that vision um, inspired by the Teton Science School in Jackson, Wyoming. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but our initiators uh, worked at the Teton Science School. Jack was the executive director there for 25 years and, um, and looked towards the Wasatch Front and said, 
there is absolutely no reason why innovative, immersive, residential, outdoor education experiences can't exist uh, in these mountains, in the Wasatch Front and back. And so we have a bold vision uh, for Utah and for Salt Lake City. And I won't walk you through in great detail all of it tonight, but I'll just give you um, a brief overview of the vision and the sites, uh, but more specifically the one that's in Salt Lake. Uh, we wanna connect children, families, school groups, and, and people of all walks of life to the recreation and educational components of our great landscapes here in Utah. And our vision is built on the Every Kid Outdoors initiative that the Governor's Office of Outdoor Rec passed in 2019. Um, the four of us on the Wasatch Mountain team are educators uh, by training and, and school administrators, and we see that these 10 No Child Left Inside initiatives are things that can be accomplished in a really fantastic way within um, an educational and recreational context and that we can uh, deliver programming that achieves all of these goals for school groups, for underserved schools, uh, for, for all communities uh, in the Wasatch Front and back. And so we have a vision to create a five campus institute uh, that operates on both sides of the range that gives a comprehensive watershed uh, education and allows people to recreate and learn in a variety of contexts. And I won't go into detail on the four sites of the Wasatch Back tonight, but when I'm done, I will pop our website into the chat. We have a prospectus and more detailed documents on our website about those sites. But what I wanna focus on as it is relevant to you all is what we're calling Salt Lake City Squared or the Salt Lake City Science Learning Center that um, is what we also like to call our urban portal. Um, we want to have top of the watershed mountain education up on the peaks and also bring students and teachers to the Jordan River to see where the water goes uh, within our watershed. And so we've searched uh, for a site along the Jordan River that meets a need where there is not currently an outdoor classroom site or an underutilized portion of the Jordan River Parkway. Um, we've talked with Soren Simonson at the Jordan River Commission. We're working um, collaboratively with the Tracy Aviary site down south and we see uh, the, the future of the Jordan River as you know Brian's group in Seven Canyons is doing, creating these centers of activity and education and recreation throughout the whole Jordan River corridor. And so we found a site uh, that we think plays into that vision of being another place to bring people for different reasons to the Jordan River uh, corridor. And here are some of the, the site criteria and the types of programming that we are looking to, to implement here. Um, and one important note is that um, the site and the buildings that we are gonna be talking about this evening are um, going to be publicly owned. We do not want to buy the land the, that I'll show you. We just want to, and we're working with the city and the county to have agreements in place to operate uh, on the land. Um, but the site is just north of the Northwest Recreation Center uh, between Cottonwood Park and Constitution Park. And if you can see my arrow, it's this triangular piece of land here that is currently um, overgrown, um, not landscaped, not maintained. Uh, and the, the ownership boundaries were drawn uh, and then the river moved. And so uh, part of the site is county owned and is adjacent to Constitution Park along the south end uh, and then also abuts the river. And then the remainder along uh, this side here is city property. And so, um, we're working to attain permissions um, and, and collaboration in those two entities to, to operate on the site. Um, but this is, this is where we are. This is what it looks like. Um, and the goal here is that in an, a location adjacent to the river trail and accessible to public users and in an area that is relatively close to a few different schools, we would uh, build a center that can host small group outdoor science education and recreation programs for classes in a half day context and for uh, teacher professional development and also act as a community environmental education resource. And 
Um, again, this is an aerial view of the site ownership. And our, our hope is to build right here, and I've got another map that shows um, a site that would allow access to the river. We're working with Soren to be in the next round of boat launches uh, that get uh, funded and built along the river. Um, but along the side here, you can see some of our design goals. Uh, we're working with architects right now to finalize uh, draft plans for this and, and seek feedback from community councils on those as well once they are complete. But for, for right now, what we wanted to do is present the idea, show some of the concept, describe some of the benefits so that we could get initial feedback uh, from, from all the councils that are adjacent to, to this site. Um, one of the things that attracted us to this site is that with the Northwest Recreation Center being here already, uh, some of the bus access for school buses can utilize the existing turnaround and parking lot area. So we're hoping um, to do that and then to just uh, put in a gravel road and parking area to minimize the impact on, um, on this, oh gosh, I always get turned around with the directions here, on this western side of, uh, of the field leading up to uh, the property and then a trail that would access the center. And then from that, uh, education center, there'd be a network of kind of informal trails and native landscaping and to revegetate the area in a more inviting way uh, that could be used by the public uh, and as well as um, by our program groups. And we feel that this is an important piece of our overarching vision because we can educate students, we can serve as a hub of learning for local teachers and contribute to you know, one more node along the Jordan River that activates the community, that gets people out um, and learning and, and enjoying their backyard. Um, an example of the kinds of programs uh, that we would love to offer local students here, um, we took uh, 57 kids from Backman Elementary, just right up the road from this site, on an overnight camping trip in American Fork or Diamond Fork, excuse me, uh, in October. Um, that was an overnight uh, piece, and that's a lot of what we'll do on our sites on the Wasatch Back, our extended immersive overnight camping, three and four day residential experiences, um, where we can combine outdoor recreation with science education and classroom community building. Uh, at the day site, it is that, but shortened, um, and hopefully we'll uh, build into a network of uh, program offerings where schools can can see and experience that type of education in a shorter term half day Jordan River field trip as well as um, and build upon that and, and do some overnight experiences with us as well. But I bring this up uh, and I wanted to share about our pilot only because um, the students, the faculty, the parents who, who came on this experience couldn't wait to come back for more. They're already excited to plan for this year, even given the current circumstances. They're willing to be creative and think about how can we do this even now because it was such a powerful educational experience. And so we're hoping with this site to bring that uh, to, to more people locally, um, and then also to, to get them on those overnight um, experiences. And, and the whole concept is to, to really empower the next generation of stewards for public lands and, uh, and the spaces along the Wasatch front and back and our resources here. Um, and, uh, and with that, you all have had a lot of presentations tonight. And so I don't wanna take up any more of your time. Um, I'm happy to entertain questions, but also um, I will put, as I said, my, um, my contact info and our website in the chat so that if you have follow-up um, or wanna learn more, you are able to. But um, just wanted to share, share initially uh, this plan that is very much in its infancy and, and get community feedback and, and buy-in from, from the get-go. Thank you, Hillary. That was wonderful. Uh, Hillary, it's Andrew Johnson from uh, the City Council. It's a great uh, idea. Holy, uh, holy um, endorse it and, and thank you for coming to the area. Um, if for some unforeseen and unfortunate reason that site doesn't work out, would you come back and see me? Yes, 
Absolutely. I have a couple other ideas if you need another plan. All right. Fantastic. I think we'd love to connect with you. Is one of them a mansion? What's that? I said, is one of them a mansion? <laughs> or a water park? <laughs> or a water park. <laughs> I got three or four ideas up our sleeve between Glendale and Poplar Grove. <laughs> Um, Hillary, is the presentation that you shared uh, public? Could we include that in the minutes from our meeting? Yes, absolutely. I can share that with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, if there are no questions for Hillary, I will move on and we'll get ready to close the meeting. Um, well, I just wondered what the timeline is on your project and how, I know you're trying to get you're trying to work with all the owners of the land and the properties, but what is the timeline? Well, um, the answer to that question was a little bit different two and a half months ago, uh, <laughs> because um, as, as they should be, everyone we're working with at the county and city levels has been um, laser focused on COVID and, and we yeah. have not been able to proceed as we had planned. Um, that said, we, we did receive some Governor's Office of Outdoor Recreation funding for some of our other sites. Um, we, we are working actively to acquire the Oakley School in Oakley, Utah as our pilot residential site. It is currently for sale. And so that's really where um, our first priority is, just given the nature of the, the fact that it's for sale now and we need to get it before anyone else does. Um, and so that coupled with our Rock Cliff Recreation Area site, our sites we've gotten grants for and are working to uh, put in kind of as phase one and then, and then this would come next. So um, it is very hard to know a timeline uh, given all these uh, variables, but I, I would say optimistically and hopefully, um, you know, within two years, it would be fantastic to have something, um, but but maybe more in the two to five year range to actually be be operational on a site uh, like that. Um, Jack and Wayne, correct me if I'm wrong there, but that's uh, that's how it feels at the moment. <laughs> okay, that's great. So this is Andrew again. I should clarify my last comment so everyone knows. I think. They all know what I'm talking about. Um, well, I used to work at the Oakley School. It's a beautiful place. So if you can get it, yeah, get it. Gorgeous, gorgeous property up there. Great location. Um, we have the Fisher Mansion here that's right on the river. It's city owned, obviously. It needs some repairs and some upgrades. Um, but I go to bat for that and that property, which is sitting right on the river. And we'll have a boat launch as of this year, maybe next. Um, but we also have some other vacant lands that are city owned or county owned along the river, starting at about 17th South, um, clear up to the Fisher Mansion on 2nd South. Um, so I'm serious about um, if you need a backup plan or uh, another option, um, come see us. Okay, great, thank you. If I could just say, this is Wayne Turner, uh, uh, part of Wasatch Mountain Thanks, Institute. Wayne. I just wanna say, hey, thank you very much, Andrew. We'd love to visit with you regardless. Uh, to get to the site that Hillary just presented, we've looked at a number of sites up and down the Jordan River, including the mansion. Uh, the mansion has some challenges for the kind of programming and infrastructure that we would want, but we love the idea of the boat launch going in there and the way that they're using that carriage house. But uh, we would love to follow up with you and, and maybe uh, just compare notes because uh, the more the merrier. So thank you for, for introducing yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna move to start closing the meeting. Eric, I wanna give you the opportunity. You have any community announcements from Poplar? And this is open to everyone. If you have community announcements or things going on after Eric goes, please feel free to make your announcements. Yeah, so just two things. Uh, the first one is, is kind of sad news in some ways, or actually in all ways, is that uh, we are canceling Groove in the Grove in the face of the coronavirus ep epidemic or pandemic. And so uh, to that extent, it's not gonna be happening this year, but we are gonna be working through this time to make sure that next year it's gonna be really a lot better and that we will we'll be having it next year. And like I had mentioned before, anybody who is in the Poplar Grove area, um, please reach out to me um, in the chat. We would love to have you involved if you're interested. 
we have open board positions. And so I would love to chat further with you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else with announcements? Uh, we have a town, the Westview, Westview Media has a town hall coming up. It's a, it's all census related. And we're, um, maybe Turner could speak to it actually, or Eric. Sure. Um, yeah, so next Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. we're doing, a, like Charlotte said, a census town hall. Uh, Mayor Mendenhall will be kicking off the town hall, and then we have some community activists and advocates uh, that will be talking about why the census is so important. Between June 1st and June 30th, the city, Salt Lake City, will be competing against West Valley, Provo, and I can't remember the other cities, um, to increase our census participation rate. The west side has traditionally been undercounted and we want to improve the counting of the west side. Uh, it's mm -hmm. super important when it comes to funding and everything from our congressional to our legislative representation is determined by the census in addition to billions in um, federal funding that come into the city, or not billions into the city, but uh, that are dispersed across the country and, and funding that comes into the city for everything from housing to schools to police and firefighters. So please participate in that next Wednesday night, 5.30. It'll be live streamed um, from the SLC Gov, Westview Media, and Westside Coalition Facebook pages. And then, um, um, oh. Oh, are you gonna, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> one more, the, the Westview is putting out a summer issue, so we didn't get a spring issue out, but we, uh, we've been working hard to, to get this summer issue out. So look for it in your mailboxes around the first week of June. And, um, you know, we are, I just wanna put out an invitation to anybody who would like to attend our community newsroom meetings. They're open to all West Side residents and, or people who work here, anybody who, who, who feels like they're a, community member of the west side um, so those happen on the third tuesday and the third friday of every month and if you go to our west view media facebook page you can we'll have events for those um, but you know it's really important to have our voice our voices heard and to um I think to support local journalism and we I appreciate all of you who have supported the West View and look for us in June. Thanks Charlotte. Um, the last thing I'm going to take or make two quick announcements on behalf of Glendale. I mentioned one midway through the meeting that we are starting this one Glendale planning process. Um, if you are interested in being involved in that, uh, please let me know. And the second piece is that we, Glendale is starting a chapter of Keep America Beautiful, um, which will eventually grow into a statewide affiliate here and we'll be able to kind of export what we do in Glendale to other communities throughout the state. Keep America Beautiful is a national organization focused on beautification and cleanup, promoting recycling. Um, we are planning our first cleanup events um, as early as next month, we'll have some funding and support from this national organization. So if you're interested in being involved, um, we would love to have you involved. And the last thing that I will say is that if you have community updates or things that you want to get out, please share them with the community council. Um, I will put Glendale's website in the chat right now. And uh, Eric, if you would type in Poplars, so everyone has it. Uh, unless anyone has anything else, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting.